So how many of you have been studying your Bible this week? I talked to you about getting into the Word last week, right? Don't knock me down with amens. Did you study your Bible this week? I didn't say read it. I said study. we got to know the Word. We talked about last week. He says that you don't know Him because His Word's not abiding in you. We've been doing a beginning a study in 1 John. We started last week, and we pointed out three primary words last week that are in the book of 1 John. The first word we pointed out was the word in, I-N. The second one we pointed out was no, K-N-O-W, not N-O, but to know. And third, we talked about the word abide. I believe I counted... About 70-something times the word in appears in 1 John. Let me check myself on that real quick. Yeah, over 70 times. The word no appear over 30 times, and we found that the word believe only appeared about five to seven times. So John had put emphasis in the book of 1 John, and not only 1 John, but 2 John and 3 John, on what we are in. And who we know, because he's taking us to a progressive level from not just believing and having faith, but in knowing. So we talked about that he last week, one of the main emphasis of the, of the book of First John is being in him, Christ, being in Christ. He talked about being in the light or whether we were in the darkness. He talked about whether we were in truth or in error. He also talks about whether I am in life or in death. So we find over and over John talking to us about what we're in. This has began to lead to something a little different for me this week. Let me bring this up. I don't know where all the Lord's going to go with this. But one of the things that the Lord has began talking to me about out of this is going to be right here in 1 John chapter 1, and it's going to be verse 4. I'm going to bring that up in just a minute. This has been a struggling week for me as a person, just as an individual. It seemed like there is difficulty, aggravation on every possible level. At the very same time, I'm hearing the Lord speaking to my heart about me living in joy. What great wrestlings and struggles there are. You know, sometimes at the very time when God begins to talk to you about something, it seems like there will be the greatest intensity of, uh, and occasion for you to be unhappy in life. And at the same time, God can be talking to you about you living in joy. You know, it's no different than God beginning to talk to you about love, and you can have every occasion for unforgiveness, uh, to hate people, backbite, talk about them. But at the same time, God can be speaking to you about love. So what I'm sensing here from the Lord is he began talking with me and I don't believe that this is just for me, this is for all of us, is about living in joy and the very pursuit of joy. I want to go to 1 John 1 and verse 4 to start off with. We read this last week. John says here very simply, These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So I need to stop right here in 1 John and know something about the totality of this book. If we're going to take this book in its context and we're going to take these scripture texts of what they are saying, I know that we can pull many of them for certain instances in our life. If there's, we're struggling with a particular sin or something's going on, we can go to 1 John 1 and 9 and it says, that if we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, I mean, there, there are many scriptures here that we can take as an individual verse and use it for particular instances in our life. This verse of scripture right here in 1 John 1 and 4 is giving me an overall summing up of what John is writing about and what he's going to write to us about in all of what he's going to say. He's telling you, I'm writing this to you that your joy, not somebody else's, not just the joy of Jesus, but your joy may be half empty, half full, never seen, unknown. No, he says that your joy may be full. So I'm deriving from this very verse of Scripture that everything that John is writing to us about is about me coming into a place of fullness of joy. That's what he said he's writing about. This means that, that John is going to deal with many subject matters and things that surround our life that are killing our joy. As they say, uh, kill joy. Anything that is taking joy away from me. He also is going to tell me where I need to be at in order to maintain or stay in this fullness of joy. So my heart is attentive to this. I'm listening with intensity here of what the apostle is communicating to us by the Holy Spirit because this is something for me as a person that I want. This is not only something that I want, this is something that I need. This has been something that I've had in the past and have let it slip. So my heart has got to pay attention to this. If there is one thing that, that I know that most of us uh, and the world is looking for, the world is looking to be happy. People are looking for anything and everything they, they can and get their hands on in order to be happy and what they think will make them happy. I want to go on just for just a second before I get any deeper into this. I had one of my sons, I don't know, it was maybe uh, two weeks ago. It was Ezra. He was, I remember he was going around and he was asking everybody, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? One wish. And he came up to me, I believe I was sitting at our kitchen table and I was working on something and he said, Dad, if you had one wish, what would you wish for? Just one. You could get anything that you wanted. What would you ask for? So I sat and I thought about it a minute. What would I really want? I want you to think about that for a minute. What, would I, what, do, you, what do you really want? What do you want in life? And what is it, what is that? one thing that would really just satisfy you? What is it, that one thing that would make you not want anything else? What is that? So I looked at Ezra and I told him one thing. And it came from the book of 3 John. If you flip over there just for a minute. This is 3 John 4. This is what I told him. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He said, he had said to me, Dad, if you had one thing that you wished for, what is it? And I said, this is what I wish for. I would wish that my children would walk in truth. John says that he has no greater joy. Because as I sat there and thought about what he was asking me, I thought, well, I could wish for this, but that wouldn't mean anything for them. I could wish something upon myself, 
Do you know that the word to pray does mean to make a wish? Did you know that? It means that I'm wishing that God would do some certain thing. This is why we have the right to come into his throne and make a request because I'm, I'm wishing that God will do a certain thing. Now, God can refuse me and he can say, no, I have something better in mind. That's when we're left to praying in our own opinions and our own desires. Nothing wrong with that. God invites you to come and get those things off of your heart. But there's no greater joy than to hear that your children walk in truth. Now, you may sit and say, well, I'm not a parent, but you are the child of someone, no matter who you are. It is no greater joy to a parent than that their children walk in truth. What a grief it is when a child uh, does not walk in truth. This is one of the greatest joys, I believe, as a, a Christian, is to see my children not only walk in truth, but to want the truth and to desire the truth. For me, that equates into the same thing that John says. There is a joy in that that you can't exchange or replace for anything. I'm sure that the day that my life was turned over to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sure that it was a great joy to my mother. It was probably a great relief because of all of the heartache the agony that I put her through. I'm sure it was a great joy. This is something that I believe that we can begin to take and begin to pray. God, I want my children to walk in truth. Not just so that I can have joy, but it's going to be a relief to everyone. It's going to be a relief to everyone that they're surrounded by and everyone that they are involved in and whose lives are touched by that. I want to go on here to John 15 and verse 11. Jesus says this, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. I want to stop and pray for just a minute. <coughs> Heavenly Father, this is something that I need to be greatly reminded of. I don't know what obstacles are going to come with this. I don't know what challenges I'm going to face. But I know that this is something that you have designed, God, for every believer to walk in and to live in. You have designed for us to walk in joy and to walk not only just in some joy, but to walk in a fullness of joy and to walk in an everlasting joy and to walk in a joy that does not fade away. I don't know all of these things, Father, but I do know that I have experienced in time past. I have experienced times of joy, God, and even times of sorrow and mourning. But God, your word says that you give us an oil of joy that is for mourning. This is something that I believe from your word that we can have and come into and something that does not fade away. But Lord, this is going to be a learning process that we all together have to learn by you and be taught and instructed by your spirit. So God, my heart wants to hear this. I want to hear what your word has to say concerning this. I don't want to hear what just I have to say or somebody else has to say. I want to know what your word says. So I pray that you set our hearts to dig into this because all of this is hidden in your word, but it's hidden for us. May we discover this. May we find this. And may we begin to walk in this. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus says that he has joy. He says, my joy might remain in you. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that it comes and goes. It remains. It steadily lives. It's fixed. It's positioned inside of me. And that your joy may be full. Lord have mercy. This is something that I believe it was Wednesday night when we were praying 
I don't remember the exact context of what I was praying, but somebody, somebody stopped me on the sidewalk before we left, and they said, I know that what you just prayed is what every believer needs. And I was praying that believers would be filled with joy because this joy is contagious. I'm going to go off of my off from here and off of my notes. So let's just go over to the book of Joel real quick. Can we go over there? Just the book of Joel, just find this in the Old Testament. This is chapter 1. From Joel chapter 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, you inhabitants of the land, hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your father? Now I want to stop you and just tell you for a minute that what Joel is going to begin to talk about is the joy of the Lord. Because if you drop down to verse 12, he says, The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languishes, and the, pom excuse me, the pomegranate tree, and the palm tree also, and the apple tree, and even all the trees of the field are withered. My Bible has a colon after the word withered, which means he's going to list what he's talking about. Because, I have the word because, if you're reading from the King James, I have because underlined. He says, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. If I back up just a couple of verses, he tells me, in verse 3, tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. This is something that can be transferred. A fullness of joy or either a lack of joy. This can be transferred from one generation to another and from a, a parent to child. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, That which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. And that which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. And that which the uh, canker worm has left, the caterpillar of wheat has eaten. He says, Awaken you drunkards and weep and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. God goes on to tell them in the book of Joel that what he is going to restore unto them is joy. This is what has been withered away from the children of God, that they no longer have any joy. This is, I'm going to be honest with you, this is one of the most miserable places as a believer. It is a miserable place as a believer to have faith in Christ and to have all of the answers on the inside of you, but at the same time, everything seems to be wrong and you have no joy. You have, I mean, you, life just seems like misery. This is not God's intention for us. I'm not saying that you're going to be problem free or you're going to be stress free or you're going to be worry free. There's going to be cares that face us. But this is about us going on from those things and moving beyond circumstances in life. So I'm going to bring this up here. This is the word joy. This seems out of focus. What is up with this? Does that look out of focus to y'all? There it is. That's better. The word kara means to be cheerful, calm, delight, or gladness, or to cheer full. To be full of cheer. So I'm looking at this word, and I'm knowing that God wants me to be cheerful, and he wants my, my cheer to be full. What is this cheer about? Anybody know what the word cheer means? What does it mean to cheer? When you were a cheerleader, you used to yell out. And encouraging the team. So something is being cheered on. 
Okay, well, let's, let's grab hold of that. And oh, your name's Joy. You should know this, right? <laughs> or having a calm delight or gladness. So here's where I want to begin to talk about some things is the expression of joy versus the causes of joy. Because the Bible talks about me being able to express joy. You're telling me that, that a cheerleader, she's expressing something, right? She's not just sitting on the sideline going, rah, rah. Go team. All right, cheerleader, show us what they do. They turn flips, right? They're jumping up in the air. They're trying to get other people. It's a sport now. They're trying to get other people excited. Why? Y'all ever played sports and have people cheering for you? It changes. It changes how the dynamic of how you play. When a, when a crowd gets in it, they call up in Seattle, they call the crowd the 12th man on the field because the uh, the Seattle Seahawks have such a fan base that that it it brings a, a like a, another person in. So there's a, a a factor here of joy and cheering something on, and the expression of it. But I want to get a little further than that and look at the causes of joy. So I made several notes to myself. If you want to make some, sometimes. We have the occasion to be downcast in life. This is not something that uh, is new to us or to Scripture because David says that his soul had been downcast or downtrodden. But he says to his soul, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Because he says, Why are you downtrodden? different translation than most of the time but there's all of the occasion to grumble and every occasion to be able to complain given in a, the the scope of a 24-hour day I would hate to know if I sat there with a counter on how many times I grumbled and complained about something in a day it's it's probably really bad this is why I believe God surrounds us with a family it gives you a wife and children because they hear what you're saying and they know exactly what's coming out of your mouth. If they say something to us about it, we have a tendency to get offended about it, but rather I think we should listen with a uh, intentful or heart on what other people are saying. I'm not saying that everything that people say about us is true, but I do know this. Going on from here, <coughs> joy in the Bible has a certain longevity to it or a lasting uh, that is much more complex than happiness. The Bible talks about being joyful and it also talks about being happy. I need to know the difference between the two. Here's what I'm saying in this. Happiness, I wrote this down, there it is. Happiness has contingencies to it. In other words, whenever the Bible is talking about being happy, there is something that I do or something that I do not do. Proverbs 16 and 20 says, He that trusts in the, the Lord, happy is he. So if I'm not trusting God, I'm not going to be happy. I have Ecclesiastes 2 here. Many times people don't like the book of Ecclesiastes because it seems woeful. What it is is it is truthful. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 2, he says, I had all wisdom. All of my wisdom I gave myself over to wine in order to find out. Now I want you to go on and listen to what he's telling us. He wanted to find out the folly in wine. And strong drink. In his wisdom, I'm not suggesting that you do that. 
because what he says, he goes on further. That this began to lead him, his pursuit of wine, in his wisdom, he's thinking above the wine, but the wine begins to talk to him, and it begins to tell him that you are unhappy. So he says, I began to do what wine is telling me to do. And he said, I went and I planted trees, and I planted vineyards. I planted every kind of tree there is, and every kind of fruit tree there is. He goes on and he says, I had men servants, maid servants, servants born in my house. I got silver and gold. I attained more wealth than any person that was before me. He went on all of these pursuits, and at the end of this, he says, it was all vanity and vexation of spirit. So we derive from Ecclesiastes that joy is not found in things or the abundance of things. Neither is it found in the lack of things. Joy's association, biblically, has nothing to do with anything that is in this world. Things in this world can make you happy. But you must know this about happiness. Happiness does not last. Joy is everlasting. Isaiah said that everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The Bible never says that happiness is everlasting. So there has to be a distinction between happiness and joy. Now, joy, I brought this up, is a product of the supernatural. Joy is not something that is natural. I derived that from Galatians 5 and verse 22. When, he, when the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. One of these things that is expressed here, because he goes on talking about later the works of the flesh, and they are things like hatred, variance, emulation, strife. Joy is a product that comes from the Spirit of God. It is supernatural. It does not have anything to do with the known world. So I've got to make a distinction here. Because I believe in my, in my past, I have confused happiness with joy and I'm learning I've got to learn here how to separate the two so what's going to be what am I going to be faced with well happiness will fade away because happiness only comes from insecure sources I wrote these down for myself in some notes money can bring happiness but money can leave. That's why Solomon went on and said, not to set your affections or your heart upon what you have financially, because he said, money is like an eagle. It has wings. It will fly away and never return to you. He should know he had plenty of it. You cannot, so money can ha make you happy. People think if I win the lottery, I will be happy. No, you won't. Because happiness, it does not stay. Happiness fades away. Say that with me. Happiness fades away. But you know what? God has given us in life, we are able to experience happiness and joy. But I need to know that happiness leaves. It doesn't stay. I made another note to myself. Health. When we are healthy, we're typically, we can be happy about it. We don't take a fault for it. But when something begins to go wrong 
and you begin to have pains or discomfort, it has the occasion to make you unhappy. You can become irritable. I can. When I don't feel good, I can get just ill. Even my wife will say, I know you don't feel good, but you, you don't have to act like that, Todd. I'm sorry. The, what I'm trying to say is when, when health is present, happiness can be there. But I can be in joy and something not be right. I'm going on from there. A companion, a companion can make you happy. But just as everything else in this world, a companion can pass away and happiness then leaves. A companion will do things that are uh, not right and can take happiness away. I had told April this morning, I, I was watching my oldest son Zeke and, and he and his girlfriend this morning, they're getting ready to leave for church. Uh, they're just elated, you know, with one another. I told April, I said, this is how we need to be, April. We just need to be elated with one another. I said, uh, you know, when I come home, I'm going to just run and jump in your arms. And she said, how much do you weigh? <laughs> we just need to be elated with one another like this. You know, happiness comes and goes. And this is what a lot of people, you know, this is where, this is where, think about this. This is the grounds that people make divorce over. I'm just not happy. They don't make me happy anymore. Well, did no one tell you that that person's not going to always make you happy? Sometimes they're going to make you mad. Sometimes you're going to want to choke them. And when happiness goes away, what do you do then? Friends. Here's another thing. Friends can make you happy. But friends can also make you very mad. This is life. So I have to look at every occasion of happiness. Happiness is a, to me, is, it's a gift from God. But I have to know that happiness doesn't stay. What I need to be in, this is why John didn't say up here, these things I write unto you that, you're, that you'll be happy. That's not what he says. You don't find the apostles talking very much about happiness. Because there's an understanding in the early church that happiness goes away. So I'm going on here. Properties. You know, I've never owned a brand new car in my whole life. I'm 42 years old. But when you get an, another car, I'll say another because I don't know the new car experience. But when you get another car, or a, I, have, I have had a new house. When you get a new house, it's like the smell. You love that smell. I loved walking in my new house, looking around. Everything was just perfect. Now it's not. I have five boys, and there's holes in the vinyl siding, holes in the porch, porch railings kicked in, holes in the sheetrock, dirty hand marks down the wall, carpet stains, hard places in the carpet where there's glue. The table, you know, I went to get on the, the bar stool the other day and it had red magic marker all over it. I'm like, Levi, I want to just beat you. And you try to explain to them, do you see that big rip in my couch? It took me over a week of my life working to pay for that thing. The occasion for happiness goes away with no matter what it is. You can have, man, I used to have a, man, I had a nice low rider and smashed it into the back of another woman's car. Happiness went away. Things wear out. We sometimes in life wear out. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is everything, any and everything that, that we have, it's subject for happiness to go away. And you may think, well, I have everything protected. That are called natural disasters that takes people's entire lives away. You know, it doesn't matter how much you, you can have a guard dog and an alarm system and bars and gates and everything else. 
and a flood comes through like happened last week and people's entire lives are gone. The occasion to be unhappy is there. But the Bible tells us that we don't have to live in unhappiness. Every circumstance can be there for me to be unhappy, but at the same time for me to be in joy. This, to be in joy is what I said. So, <clears throat> I will not try to belabor this too much. The Bible does tell me that there is a certain pursuit of joy. And it's not that I'm going to, let me see how I want to say this. Lord, I need help. In order to pursue something means that I don't have something. This is not what the Bible is telling me. The Bible is not telling me that I do not have joy. What the Bible is telling me as a believer is I'm not accessing it and I'm not living in it and I'm not living in its fullness. If I have the Spirit of God on the inside of me, I am a believer. If I am in Christ and He is in me and His Spirit is in me and I am in Him, then there is joy. It's there, but I'm just not accessing it, nor am I living in it. So John the Apostle is trying to tell us, first and foremost, out of 1 John, what's stifling it. He says, if you're walking in darkness, or if you say that you know God and you are doing something else, all of this is things that are taking joy away in my life. Now the Bible does say there is a certain pursuit to joy. One of my favorite scriptures, and if this, this scripture is Psalm 1611. Anybody know what it says for it? Don't look it up. Anybody know what it says? You probably hear me quote this scripture in this building more than any other verse of scripture. Yes, indeed. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I've given you a whole list of scriptures up here about in the pursuit of joy, about getting into God's presence or either worshiping him or praising him or shouting unto him. The Bible says that we are to make shouts of joy. Does that mean that I am, I'm just elated and in joy all the time? No. This is about me entering into or accessing what is available. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. We're talking about full joy, right? He says, I'm writing these things that their joy may be full. Jesus said, my joy might remain in you, then that your joy might be full. In his presence there is fullness of joy. This is accessible to me. This is attainable. I can, look at your neighbor and tell them, I can, I can live in the fullness of joy. I can. Now look at them and say, why aren't you? Oh my. Now look at somebody else and ask them the same thing. Because then this is what we have to discover. I've got to begin to identify everything and every occasion of which I am not living in something that is everlasting and it exceeds above every circumstance of life. This has nothing to do whether I am happy or not. I could sit here today and think of every reason in the world that I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy with the country. I'm unhappy with the laws. I'm unhappy with the president. I'm unhappy with the Congress. If you watch the news long enough, you will be unhappy. But you know what? I can also sit there and watch all of that bad news and have joy. I can watch the whole world going into madness and chaos and still have joy. It does not have to rob my joy. We used to sing a beautiful song back in the churches that this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, no, no. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. 
The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. So what am I letting take it away? I'm letting something take it away. I've got to take some responsibility here in this. So the Bible does tell me that I can have fullness of joy. Look at what the, uh, the apostles, I'm just going to quote some of these. You can write them down for yourself. It would be good for you to write these down, spend some time thinking about them. Peter says that the saints are to have a joy that is unspeakable and they are to be full of glory. Joy that is unspeakable. That means they can't even express it. I talked about the expression of joy. This is a place where I can't even express my joy. <coughs> Peter also goes on and talks about having an exceeding great joy. You can find these other verses about this. The Bible does tell us that we need to rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5 says that we need to rejoice forevermore. Rejoice is based out of the word joy. It means that I go back and I find my joy. Joy is something that we walk away from. You don't have to go back and find it. The Bible also goes on in James 1 and he says that we are to count it all joy when we fall into different tribulations or testings or trials or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's a test, trial, tribulation, pressure. It doesn't matter. Death, life, circumstance, angel, demon, whatever. It doesn't matter. You are to count it as joy. I'm going to go ahead and tell you as a believer, I have not arrived in this place. I am on a pursuit of going there. I want to get there. There has been times in the past when I have had the exceeding great joy. I can remember uh, so, for such a long extent of my life of having the joy of the Lord. I, I mean, just getting up and worshiping God, uh, getting into his word. And I don't know, it was just, it was bringing something to my life that I didn't even realize was there until I got around the world. I would show up down at pledges, Philip, and I remember they'd have those morning meetings, and I'm sitting there just, and people are looking at me on Monday morning thinking, what kind of drugs are you on? I got to ask that. I was like, man, I'm on the most high. I'm on God, man. And people, that when you are, have that joy, sometimes you don't even realize it because you're immersed in it and it just becomes natural to you. The world, I, they immediately identify this. I'm going to take responsibility for my own life. It is one of the worst witnesses in the world for someone to know that you are a believer and to see nothing but misery on our faces. It's the worst witness to, I'm taking responsibility for it. I am sorry. I repent. I have got to, this has got to change. Lord have mercy. If we go out here in the world with a long face and then, God want to follow Jesus. I mean, people look like they hate following Jesus. If following Jesus is a joy, then that joy should be coming out from us. The world, the world recognizes a couple of things. It recognizes love, joy, and peace. Because those are the three main things that it's looking for. People in the world want love. They want joy because they know, they know. Things are not going to make them happy. They've been heartbroken over and over and over, and they're unhappy and they're miserable. But you'll keep repeating the same thing. You know, it's like, I've seen some. I've seen uh, women that just let men abuse them, treat them just like dirt, and they—it's like they can't get enough of it. But they're unhappy. I'm trying to talk to you about going on from from things of this world. <coughs> the Bible talks about us shouting with joy. Shouting, I know this place. I used to just go out in my yard and just shout. You remember that, Mama? 
I shouted so much. I mean, we lived out in the country. People showed up at the house. I'm out there one night just shouting. And this guy walks up and he says, man, are you all right? I'm like, yeah. I'm just shouting. I remember one time I was, I was at Pledges again, Philip, and I was in the back of a tractor trailer that's loading 110 degrees in there. I'm throwing boxes and I'm just shouting and praising God. Glory! Hallelujah! And all of a sudden, you got that feeling like somebody looking at you. I turn around and the whole warehouse plant is at the back of the truck staring at me. And I said, Glory! <laughs> and went back to throwing boxes. Yeah, they're wondering what in the world this guy has lost his mind. Yeah, joy doesn't have anything to do with my mind. It doesn't, but it, it does have something to do with my thoughts. I've been bringing up some scriptures. I'm going to move quickly. Write this down for yourself. John 16, 20 through 24. Jesus is talking about asking. He's talking about joy. He's talking about prayer. This scripture I brought out Wednesday night in prayer meeting. Paul was talking about, he said, I make requests with joy. I was talking about praying within joy, being in joy and praying. Joy, prayer should be a joy to us. Why do I say that? Because Isaiah 56 and 7, y'all know this is one of the foundational scriptures of this church, and he says that my house will be called a house of prayer. But if you back up, God says, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. I believe this is why so many Christian people are so miserable today is because they don't have a prayer life and they are not connected to a church that has a prayer life. And the prayer life of the church begins to bring in a measure of joy because prayer begins to open up the measures of heaven. And the measures of heaven are measures of joy. Yes, indeed. Romans 14 and 17 says that this is the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I also notice, I don't have this one up here, but I was reading it this morning. Acts 13 and 52. The Bible says that the disciples, that they were filled with joy and filled with the Holy Ghost. It's amazing to me that the Bible equates being filled with the Holy Ghost is also being filled with joy. The, the Holy Spirit is joyful. He's always joyful. Now, I know that the Bible says that he can, you know, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to tell you something that you ain't going to take away from God. You ain't never going to take his joy away from him. You ain't never going to take his peace. And you ain't never going to take his love. Because they are everlasting, all of them. And they do not change. And he doesn't change. And it, it, it doesn't matter whether the, the sun rises or sets. He is the same. And God is continuously in joy. And if you are in him and you get into him, you begin to realize Something's got to change with me. I'm moving on here. Whew. I want to close with this verses of scripture and then we'll have communion. I know it's getting late. If you look at Philippians 4, 11. He says, not that I speak in the respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm going to bring out some things in that in just a minute. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I made some notes on this yesterday. And the reason I made notes on these verses of Scripture is because I found out that contentment being content is a seed of joy. Now, what am I saying here? Please listen to me before I close. I'm in a discovery process. And it's not that I did not know these things. Sometimes we have to rediscover things that we've let slip. I have to be big enough to realize that and accept responsibility in it. Contentment, joy, peace, and must rule in our heart. The Bible's explicit about that for us. What does this mean? Contentment is not acceptance. Stay with me for just a minute. Contentment is not that I accept the situation.
I want you to think about something that is taking your contentment away from you. Something that you've seen to let rob your joy. I'm a very organized and neat person. I love for my house to be clean and in order and everything to be in its place. One of the things I despise in life is having to look for something. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. I leave everything. I leave my wallet, my key. I leave all those things in the same place every day because I always know where they are. My shoes, whatever it is. My children don't have the same persuasion. They just leave it wherever. Daddy, you see my shoes? No. Where'd you leave them? I don't know. I'll find one in the front yard and one upstairs. I'm like, how do you do that? I always keep both my shoes together, right? They don't have the same persuasion. This thing can seem to bother me. It irritates me because I like organization because organization and order makes things simple for me. I need simplicity, Les. You know, I just don't need chaos. This thing can seem to just take it away from me. It can take joy away from me. Here's what I'm trying to say. Contentment is not me accepting what they're doing. Well, they're just going to do it, let them do it. It's not me accepting it. Here's what contentment is. Contentment is a learned process. Look at what Paul says. I have learned. This is not acceptance. This is learning. I have got to learn how to deal with this. I've got to learn how to deal with it in a way that it is not taking something away from me. Because contentment is the seed of joy. I didn't write this down up here. But this is the Greek word. The Greek word for contentment is where we is a two-part word. The first part is where we derive the word auto or something that's automatic or something that happens automatically. So I'm breaking this down. Listen to me for just a second. Contentment can happen automatically. It can. I said it can happen. This is why he's going to go and says, I can do all things. This is not separate. Jesus, Paul is talking about contentment and doing all things through Christ. It means, contentment means to automatically raise a barrier or to automatically ward off or to automatically avail or to say enough or that something is to suffice. Stay with me with this for just a minute. A process that becomes automatic for us is not always overnight. I can automatically become content if I will ward off. That's what contentment means, to ward off something. I have to raise up a barrier. Something has to be raised in the place of me becoming uncontent or my joy leaving. I have to protect this. A barrier is something. I have to protect this. I have to guard. The Bible says for us to guard our heart with all diligence. Do you agree? I've got to diligently guard this joy. I cannot let an occasion or something that happens take my joy away from me. And me begin to grumble or complain. You know, my kid's dog, man. When we first got him, that dog just beat. You couldn't leave a shoe. I mean, he chewed up thousands of dollars of shoes. And my kids sometimes will come in with a chewed up shoe. Daddy, look at my shoe. Yeah, we just bought that last week. And I'm saying, why'd you leave it outside? You know what that dog gonna do. I've done kick the dog, whack the dog. That, 
you ain't, April tried to tell me, you're not going to stop that dog from chewing up your shoes. I said, why does he want to chew up my shoe? She said, she said, this is how, it, when you're not around, this is how he is connected with you. He smells your shoe. And he's showing affection. That don't seem like affection to me. All right, I'm a, I can accept that. All right, I'll accept that. But I've got to ward this off. You have to ward that thing off. We can easily become irritated by things. Aggravate. There are so many occasions to be aggravated in this life. This literally reads. Stay with me while I finish this. I can, if you read this in Greek, I read it yesterday. I can have all things in Christ. You can go look it up for yourself. I don't know why the translators use the word do or through, but it means I can have all things in Christ. And then this goes on, and it says, I wrote it down here. Literally, in Greek, this reads, He empowers me. He empowers me. God's power on the inside of you is there for you to maintain contentment or to ward off the things or put up a barrier, the things that are trying to take, a, take joy away from you, to take peace or to rob you. You know there's a thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he will use any and every little thing. He will use things that, Lord, somebody can just come in and throw their book bag on the stairs or on the table, and you're like, I've asked them a thousand times not to do that. You take it as disrespectful. Automatically, here comes anger. Here comes uh, strife. And this thing will take away from you the atmosphere of heaven. It, that is not. Jesus put up with everything. That don't mean he accepted everything. But he never let it take away from him. In the, I believe in the middle of Jesus being crucified that he was still in joy. He says that he endured these things for the joy that was set before him. He looked at what he was going through and he thought, there's joy on the other side of this. I'm not saying that any of this is easy. We all have our own battles and wrestlings with the flesh. But thank God that we have uh, the word of God. That's why I'm asking you to get into 1 John and study it. Because the things that are contained in 1 John, can I get the elders to come on for uh, a communion? <coughs> the things that are written in 1 John are for us, to have fullness of joy. So I made a pursuit here. Not that I'm just pursuing joy. I'm pursuing what is in the word of God. That word is to bring us fullness of joy. I've got to allow this thing to penetrate my heart. I want the joy of God in its fullness. I don't want just joy. I want to live it. I want to be in it. I want to walk in it. I want to have this thing. It already, I already have it, but what needs to happen is it needs to come to its fullness. So I want to take the occasion here this morning as we're getting ready for communion. Whatever things, and the Bible says we are to examine ourselves, whatever things it is that is taking joy away from you, I believe we need to come and lay it down. It can be a person, it can be somebody's ways, it can be a job, whatever it is. We need to come and lay that thing down. We need, to, we need to examine our hearts. I want to come to this table today and have and settle things. What I want to do in fellowship with him is settling this. I want to have peace. God, I want, I want to walk in this contentment. You are there to empower me. You are there to empower me to be content and to have contentment and live in that contentment. So I believe that we can have perpetual joy. Let's take a few moments before the communion is served.
and just examine our hearts before we leave here today. Holy Spirit, I just thank you I know that as this message was being preached, Lord There were many things that you were speaking to every person in this place And to our hearts God, we come to this table today as a settling ground God, to settle this, to settle frustrations, to settle aggravations. God, to settle once and for all the issues of happiness and unhappiness. This was your joy. It was your joy to lay down your life for us. God, may we have the same mind today as we lay down things, as we lay down our lives. That's what coming to this table is about, that we enter in to your death. Not only your sufferings, but the death that you died on the cross. We enter into that same death. We enter into that place, God, that Paul talked about, where I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it is not I, but it is Christ in me.